Man, this is cool. I haven't been up here in a while with you guys. It's awesome. So for those of you guys who don't know me, I think most of you guys know me, but um, for anyone that doesn't, my name is Sydney. I am the youth pastor assistant. I don't, I don't know whatever my title is, but I'm super excited to be up here with you guys. Um, how many of you guys were here last time when Lucas preached? Show of hands. Who, who heard Lu- Lucas's me- message last time? Nice. Okay, most of you, most of you. That's good. Um, This is actually the last week of our series called Echo. Um, And what this series is all about is we're talking about things Jesus said um, that we don't want to forget. Um, Those huge things we don't want to forget that Jesus told us, um, the things that we want to echo um, throughout our lives. Um, And last week, can any of you guys who heard Lucas last week, can you tell me, anyone tell me what Lucas talked about? What's this painting about over here? Yeah, Ella. Oh, how sin takes away your connection with God. Okay. What else? What else did you guys get from Lucas's message last time? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. What do you What do you remember? He made us whole. He, so he, we sinned, and then Jesus came and made us whole from, um, from that, the separation with God. That's good. Lucas, what would you say? How would you summarize your message from last week? Nice. Yeah, super huge. Guys, that's, that's a huge, huge message that we were, lo- like what Lucas was saying earlier, we were lost and now we're found, that we get to be made new. Um, I don't know if you guys have maybe heard the gospel preached before, and a lot of times we talk about the gospel as, um, it's preached as we're just these terrible, awful sinners, um, and we're just terrible at everything, and, and we've so fallen short, and we need Jesus, which is true. Um, but I want to talk about something a little bit different tonight, and I, I want to say um, part of what Lucas was saying last week and what I'm going to say this week um, is your identity isn't just lost sinner. <laughs> when you receive Christ, you are made new. It says that you died to your old self, that you were once this awful sinner that was lost and broken and you didn't know what to do, and then you receive Christ, you give your life to him, and you're made totally new. Isn't that crazy that you get to live in life and life abundantly and that person that looked not so great gets to be something beautiful again? Um, To start out this message, I want to talk a little bit about light bulbs. Um, How many of you guys have heard the story of Thomas Edison? Who knows who that guy is? Kind of famous? Yeah. Yeah, What did he do? What's he famous for? Shout it out. Yeah, he made light bulbs. Crazy, awesome invention that totally changed the world forever. Um, But there's a story that you might not have heard about Thomas Edison. Um, So the story behind when he was making the light bulb, everyone thought he was absolutely out of his mind. He thought he was so crazy. There's no way that you can make light, like with electricity and like lightning, like what are you even talking about? You're just out of your mind. And he, Thomas Edison was like, no, I believe this is true and I'm going to make this light bulb and and I'll show you. And he had a lot riding on it. His whole reputation, everything was riding on this idea working. And so when he's making the light bulb, he's down in his workshop uh, for maybe with like, the story goes that he was with maybe 24 other people and they're all working on one light bulb. They just need to finish one light bulb and prove to everybody that this will work. And they're working and they're working and working and it takes 24 hours to make the first light bulb. How many of you guys have ever done an all-nighter? Have have you done that before? Do you feel very good after 24 hours working on... You guys are great. Um... I don't, know, I don't know about that. Usually, you're just done. After 24 hours, you're done. He finishes the light bulb. It's that eureka moment. He gets his apprentice. His apprentice is over here, um, kind of shaky and like in awe of Thomas Edison. He just made the first light bulb. And he hands the light bulb to his apprentice. And the apprentice takes it so carefully. And he's going up these stairs from the basement where the workshop was, up the stairs, 
carefully, carefully carrying it up the stairs. And then he finally makes it to the last step. And he drops it. 24 hours of work, 24 people working for 24 hours, and he drops the light bulb. And so Thomas Edison and all of his friends have to then stay up another 24 hours, 48 hours, and making another light bulb. How would you feel if you were that apprentice? What, like, what thoughts would be running through your mind? I messed up? Uh, I suck? Is that what you guys said? I run out of there? Just like, I'm done. I'm never showing my face again. Right? What do you think that Thomas Edison was probably thinking in that moment? Fired. You're f fired? Right. Yeah, you think Thomas Edison's going, I'm never, never going to trust that guy again. There's no way he's out of here. I'm done with him. Never, never trusting him again. But then something crazy happens. Thomas Edison and his friend, they're making the light bulb. They make a second one, the second light bulb. They, and what do you think they did with it? You know? Yeah. He does. He gives it to the apprentice. Crazy. You'd think he would just carry it up himself, but no, he gives it to the apprentice, and the apprentice makes it back up there. Um, here's the point. This story is actually a lot like our relationship with God. A lot of times, we have those big epic fail moments where we think we just blew it. Maybe you fall back into some sin that you thought you were totally free from. Maybe you fall back into, um, you scream at your parents. I, I don't know what that is, like big epic fail moment. And you fall back into sin and you just want to like run away. You're like, I can never show my face again to God, what you were saying. I could never, I can never go back to him. How could he ever forgive me for that mistake that I made? How would, he would never let me take that light bulb. Like, he would never trust me again to do anything. I'm going to have to earn my way back to having favor with God. But that's not what God does. It's not what God does. Um, it can be easy in those epic fail moments to think, um, to start to wonder if we could ever be forgiven, if we could ever be loved again by God, to, to believe that he could ever um, trust us again, to do the things that he's been calling us to, um, and we think that we have to go through this whole process. Maybe if I just worship for three hours, then I'll be right with God, or if I, if I just, maybe I'll read through the whole Bible, and then he'll finally forgive me, but he doesn't. It says um, in 2 Corinthians, if you guys want to turn there, you can, but I'm just going to make a quick point. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says something absolutely crazy. 5.19, it says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. In other words, when you mess up, when God says he forgives you, that the second that you ask for forgiveness when you're with God, it's as if it never happened. Some Bible translations will say um, that he totally forgets the sin. And, and I know that's confusing because he doesn't. God is all-knowing. But it's as if it never happened, meaning when you ask for forgiveness, it's as if it never happened. When you ask for forgiveness, God is saying, okay, it's done. Jesus already paid the price for that. You're my son or my daughter, son or daughter of the kingdom, and it's as if it never happened. I'm going to give that light bulb right back to you. And if you break it again and you ask for forgiveness, I'm going to give that right back to you again and again and again. And over and over and over again, God still loves you. He still forgives you. It's as if it never happened. Forgiveness from God is as if, as if it never happened. Um, so this story that I'm telling you about light bulbs and um, everything else. It's, it's one that a lot of people in the Bible are pretty familiar with, that feeling of, I screwed up, I can never do this again, um, can never be right with God. How could he ever forgive me? It's one that's really familiar, and the disciples, I think, um, are quite familiar with this. The disciples are like the friends of Jesus, the one that's, that followed him everywhere, that did everything with him. Um, and so Good Friday on Good Friday, so this is like 
what we celebrate on this Friday, the, the day that Jesus went to the cross. So right before that, the disciples, Jesus and his, his buddies are all sitting around a table and they're asking Jesus these questions and Jesus is saying, I'm going to go die on the cross. I'm going to go save the world. I love you guys so much. Um, I'm going to make everything right. And he says, but there's this, there's this problem. Not, not problem. There's this, this thing that's going to happen. You're, somebody here is going to disown me three times. That despite, I know how much you guys love me, but somebody here is going to disown me three times. Um, have any of you guys heard that story before? Do you know what I'm talking about? It says, before the rooster crows, um, they'll disown me three times. And it happens. When Jesus goes to the cross, this happens. Uh, his name is, is Peter. He, he disowns Jesus. He denies him as his best friend, the savior of the world. is going to the cross. Hardest moment in history. He disowns Jesus. And this is, this is what happens. Jesus raises from the dead to save everybody. And we pick up in John 21. Feel free to turn there if you have your Bible with you. Um, John 21, um, and it says this. This is the story that happens after Jesus died. And he comes back. Simon Peter, Thomas, uh, and two other of his disciples were together. He says, I'm going fishing, fishing, Simon Peter said to them. They went back to their jobs. They were like, okay, I, I don't know what to do now. I'm just going to go back and fish um, now that we don't know what's happening with Jesus. And we're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught absolutely nothing. And when the daybreak came, Jesus came and he stood on the shore. But the disciples didn't know yet that it was Jesus that was there. They didn't know he was back. Friends. Isn't that so cool? After everything that they did, disown Jesus, he, he calls them friends. Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. And when the disciples, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord, when G Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him um, and plunged into the sea. He just yeets right off the boat into the water, chasing after Jesus. Um, and since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the nets full of fish. And when they got out on land, they saw that there was a, a fire um, started over where Jesus was with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I'm going to pause the story right there for a second. How do you guys usually act? Like, when somebody does something against you, like, you feel like you could never forgive them. Don't you usually, like, I, I don't know, sometimes I maybe wait for that person to come up first and just apologize. Like, you should at least apologize first. Like, then I'll, then I'll treat you right. Jesus doesn't do that. When you mess up, Jesus' love is not hindered at all. He's still going, I just want you to return to me. Like, I want to be with you. And after the biggest epic fail in all of history, <laughs> denying Jesus as he's going to the cross to save the whole world, perfect, blameless, Jesus is like, you know what? The first thing I want to do, I'm going to go and I'm going to go bless my friends that just disowned me. I'm going to have them catch the biggest catch of fish that they've ever had in their life, and I'm going to cook them breakfast before they even ask for forgiveness. Crazy. That's just absolutely wild. Um, and Jesus is still doing the same thing for you guys. He's still compelling, like, I want to give you everything. He has so much for you guys. And then the story continues, and it says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Yes, Lord, he said to them. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. A second time he asked them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told them. He asked him a third time, and Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Jesus said, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. And he said this to indicate by the kind of death Peter would glorify God. Um, after saying this, he told them, come and follow me. Um, so I know that passage is maybe a little bit confusing. Um, but Jesus asks him three times. Do you guys know why he asked him three times, do you love me? Some people would say, so, so Peter denied Jesus three times, and he's saying every single time, every single time that you denied me, I forgive you for all of it. Every single time, I know that you love me. I know that you know that I'm the Savior, and you're forgiven. And not only that, he doesn't just forgive Peter in that moment, but he goes a step farther, and he says, you get to follow me. You get to go with my most prized possession, my children, my sheep, the, the, um, all of the Christians, all the Christians, all the people in the world, everyone that, that's been created by God. I want you to shepherd them. You get to take care of my most prized possession. I'm giving you the light bulb. <laughs> I'm giving you it again. And you get to take care of my sheep. That's a huge calling. So here's, the, here's, here's what I'm getting at. No matter how big of a mistake you make, Jesus' love sees you through that. There's a, there's a passage in the Bible that says, um, if the light within you is darkness. Um, and it's such a powerful verse. Because God doesn't, God with Jesus, Jesus paid for everything you could ever do wrong. He's made a way for everything that you've ever done wrong. If the light within you is darkness, God sees you for the light he created you to be. You might choose to step into darkness, but what's true about you, your created value is you are a light. You are a son and a daughter of God, and he sees tremendous value in you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are, no matter what you fall into, He's saying, I love you. I just want you to come back. The whole Bible is saying, would you just turn to me? I love you. I'm making a way for you because I just want to know you. I want you to come to me. Seek me. Find me. I have so much for you. So no matter how much you mess up, no matter what you do wrong, know this. You don't have to live in shame. It's not about how many times you ask for forgiveness. The first time you ask God for forgiveness, it's as if it never happened. If you're genuinely asking for forgiveness, it's as if it never happened. And God is saying, I'm going to give that light bulb to you again, over and over and over and over again. And salvation, it's not just this ticket into heaven, this forgiveness card, this I'm just going to believe that the gospel is real. I'm going to believe Jesus came, died, and rose again so I can just get into heaven someday. And then everything will be great when I get there. Um, and I'll just have this forgiveness card every time I ask for it. Um, both of those things are true. But when the Bible talks about salvation, when he says, lay down your life and follow me, just like he said to Peter, it's this word called sozo. And it means saved, healed, delivered, restored, totally made new. That right now, today, eternal life is available. Eternal life starts now. Eternal life doesn't begin in heaven. You can be saved, healed, delivered, made new. You can find life and life abundantly right now. That every good thing that you've ever wanted is actually abundantly in God. And that there is nothing in the entire world, nothing in the entire world that anybody, anything could give you that isn't already abundantly in God. And he's just saying, would you turn to me? Would you just 
ask for forgiveness? Would you give your life back to me? I want to hand you that light bulb, and I want to walk with you. And I want to give you so much good because he loves you. With that, we're going to head off to life groups and talk about that a little bit more, about what that looks like in your life. Um, Yeah, so go ahead and wrap up. Find your life group leaders.